Not many people who, uh, can address the issue of thinking about the clean tech sector with an economic mindset than Tom Steyer. Uh, that's the theme that we've had, Tom, through the whole event. Uh, TJ probably hit it home more than anyone, but uh, I, I don't think anyone could be addressing this better than you. Uh, Tom knows how to invest as well as anyone you've ever met in the seven years at the Clean Tech Investor Summit. A successful asset manager, entrepreneur, founded and co-managing partner of the hedge fund Farallon, also a partner at the private equity firm Hellman and Friedman. There's also not many people who've backed up their ideological views with more time, reputational, and financial commitment than Tom. He recently joined Warren Buffett and Bill Gates in agreeing to donate more than half his wealth to, to charity during his lifetime. And in our sector, most recently, as I think everyone knows and I talked about in my opening, Tom was a co-chair with former Secretary of State George Shultz of the campaign to oppose Prop 23 in California. And as I described, Tom uh, as a Democrat and, and Shultz as a Republican. Uh, Tom's on the board of trustees of Stanford University. And two years ago, uh, he and his wife founded a renewable energy research center. center. I described it uh, again when I introduced Dan Riker. It's the Steyer Taylor Center for Energy Policy and Finance. I am thrilled to have him, uh, Dan and Tom be bookends of the seventh annual Clean Tech Investor Summit, Tom Steyer. Well, that was a uh, very fulsome and uh, exaggerated uh, point about who I am. I am extremely pleased to be here today and excited. Um, I'm really here to talk about where uh, we stand as a state and a nation in the conversation about how we produce and use energy. And we had a forced conversation on this topic in the state of California, which was called Proposition 23 this fall. Um, it was forced on us by some oil companies who wanted to change our policy, but it was actually a question of where we made a virtue of necessity. Um, it was a chance for us to engage as a state in thinking about what we wanted to do going forward. Um, and we had a chance there to see how Americans respond in the only major vote that there, that's ever been held on uh, carbon emissions and how to control them. Um, and obviously we had a good, good outcome. We seem to be going the other way uh, on a national level. Uh, we failed to get a national energy bill in 2010. Um, there's an ongoing attack on the EPA insofar as it regulates carbon. And after I di finish discussing what happened in California, I want to talk about how I feel what happened here reflects what can be done on a national level and what we should be doing and what we're trying to do going forward. So that's the order of what I want to do. I want to talk a little bit about Prop 23 and try and outline my understanding of what happened and then talk about how that relates to the ongoing efforts to improve the conversation nationally. Um, the first question, you know, why would I get involved in a California proposition? Um, always a dubious undertaking. We have been, we started at Stanford trying to get the university to spend their extreme technical, engineering, scientific capabilities to the topic of how do we improve the way we produce and use energy. And that was really an attempt to focus one of the great American universities on the topic that we're all interested in is, which is how do we make a turn here? How do we change something that goes throughout American society and the American economy? How do we let technology save us from ourselves? So, you know, that was my background. I have been an investor for the last 30 years, a professional investor not having to do with clean energy, not having to do with technology, uh, basically having to do with big sums of money for schools and foundations. And when Prop 23 was proposed, I, you know, I am a Democrat, but I was assuming that I would do absolutely nothing. And when, no, when everyone else took the exact same tack which I took, which was to do absolutely nothing, eventually I got so upset and angry that I decided that I would uh, spend my time and put up some money to try and change the dynamic about how this proposition was going to work. 
So I don't think I was doing anything smart. I don't think I was doing anything calculated. I think I was just lost my temper and said, you know, I'm goddamned if this is gonna happen in our face. Um, and let me say, you know, I don't wanna overplay my role here, the, I, I, which was not that significant. It, we had a, an incredible team of people before I got there. Uh, we, the people who worked on it were many and numerous. I'm gonna explain how widespread this campaign was, but the fact is I was a cog in a team that worked very well and managed to uh, basically outmaneuver and outthink the other side, mostly because we were right. But the fact is, one thing I should say is, do not be disinclined to engage the other side or be in intimidated by their brains or their money because my experience from this and from previous campaigns is we have the brains and we can find the money. So that was my, I, I was very nervous here. Every time we had a debate, I felt like they're gonna say something new that I'm not gonna be prepared for. TJ Rogers is gonna show up with some graphs from 1723 showing there was a big blizzard and uh, I'm not gonna have to respond and I'm gonna be, and you know, it's just a bunch of malarkey. You know, the fact is we have plenty of brains, we have the facts, and the longer we wait, the more it is we're gonna win. So let me talk for a second about Prop 23 and how it worked. First of all, it was the biggest vote getter of anything in 2010. There were more people who voted against Prop 23 than voted for any candidate or any proposition in the United States. So it was not something that was just slid in under the radar. Second of all, uh, in terms of, let's talk for a second, this is an environmental proposition, supposedly, and everyone has an idea of what environmentalists look like and who votes for environmental propositions. And everybody's image of that is wrong. If you look around the state of California and ask who cares the most about the environment, the ethnic group, which it's a little distasteful to talk about this, but this is how politicians think about things. The ethnic group that polls the highest for caring about the environment is Latinos. Number two, Asian Americans. Number three, African Americans. So when you have an image of who cares about the environment, please don't assume that it, that it is the environmentalist from the 1960s. It is a different story right now. And when, you, we, when we look at the outcome of the voting, we crushed it in those groups. And that was not a given, given the, the, the topic. But we want it in all those groups. We want it both genders, although women are more supportive. We barely lost Republicans. We killed it with Democrats. And we won it in the overwhelming number of counties. To give you an example, Orange County, which is the, I would say, the poster child for conser the old-fashioned conservative California, 50.5% were yes. So they got half a percent margin in Orange County. You know, that doesn't say anything about how we did in Alameda, Los Angeles, San Francisco, where it was like 23 to 77. So that's, when you think about this, we did really well with everybody. I think that's important, but that's not the main point here. Because when we get to the national conversation, it's not so much how people poll, it's the salience. You know, my experience, which I don't wanna pass myself off as being so experienced or knowledgeable, but I've had a little bit of experience about what politicians care about, and what they care about is the things that will swing votes. Because that's their job and that's what they're playing, that's their bottom line. So they care about money into their campaign that will swing votes and polls that will swing votes. And the fact that clean energy polls really well around the United States is not that relevant. The only thing that's relevant if people will change their vote on that issue. So the reason that everyone's so freaked out about jobs right now, all of a sudden, but the parties are all freaked out about jobs is because they think they'll lose their jobs their jobs, not the 9.4% of Americans who are already out of a job. That's what they think the issue is gonna be. In California, 80% of the people who voted on Prop 23 said it was either very important or somewhat important. So that was 49% very important. Of the people who voted no, so the people who were on our side, 
58% it was, said it was very important. You really couldn't run statewide in California in 2010 without taking a position on this proposition and it changed the way people voted. Meg Whitman came out against Prop 23 in a somewhat convoluted way because she was worried about losing votes. So when we think about what happened here, it was very salient to the people of California. Let's talk for a second about what the message was that resonated with people here. Because it is not, we never used the words global warming. We never talked about climate. There were three things that re resonated with the people of California. Number one, health. People really see a connection between pollution and their health. And the people who were actually the most trusted spokespeople on this was the Mer American Lung Association. Around the state, the ads that moved people's opinions were about air pollution, because that is a way of explaining this that people can understand, that can resonate. This is not a, you know, someone once said to me, and I think it's really true, these campaigns are not the Harvard-Yale Debating Society. This is not about, you know, at the end of the day, three PhDs saying whether you won the argument. This is whether you can reach people for whom this is not their primary focus of their life. So number one was health. Number two was the economy. This was the argument that was supposed to be against us. But basically, we were able to engage and we really believe that in California, there are strong arguments why clean energy is gonna be a job creator. And we made those arguments consistently and we made them all over the place and we basically went right to the heart of their argument and tried to destroy it. And when we, you look at how people felt about this and why they voted against Prop 23, the number two reason was they really felt that Prop 23 was gonna be bad for jobs. The third point which was relevant, which was a gimme and it was a gift, and you've gotta think about it seriously is, these were out-of-state oil companies. I mean, basically, Satan came to California and tried to win a proposition. And, you know, that's a great thing. <laughs> you always want Satan to be your opponent, and in this case, it actually was. Um, and so, when you look at this proposition, let me give you a few stats about what happened. Um, it was a 23% spread. We raised 25 million bucks. Now, let's talk for one second about the difference between what we were trying to do and what they were trying to do. And this is relevant for how we're gonna go forward in the country. Basically, we were raising money for people who were doing, not doing it because they were gonna make money out of it, doing it because they deeply felt an obligation or like me, just had a short temper and behaved badly. And we were up against people who were giving money the way you give money in investing. Like, I think it's kind of a three to one payoff and you know, so I'm gonna put in five million bucks and I think I can make 15 million bucks. And so they're responding the way an investor responds. If the odds get longer, you, don't, you decide not to invest. Whereas from our point of view, if we had started to lose, if the polls had started to go against us, we would have redoubled our efforts and tw doubled the money because we weren't doing it to make money, we were doing it because we had a conviction that it was the right thing to do. So when we think about this as a contest, intellectual, political, monetary, we're, you're coming from really different places. So in the heat of battle, you've got people who are fighting for what they believe in against people who are basically investing corporate money for a return for their shareholders. And that has to be what they're doing. I mean, I said to people throughout the campaign, if these people came into California and put their money into either side of whether there should be same-sex marriage, their shareholders would you know, try and get them into jail, which is because it's just not right to take your shareholders. The only thing they can be using their shareholders' money for in good conscience is making money for their shareholders. So it's gotta be a, a risk-reward investment. Very different from what we were doing. But basically, you know, we had 3,200 people volunteering for us. My daughter dropped out of school to spend the fall volunteering for us. We made 2.8 million calls. I mean, it was, in terms, uh, it's the biggest campaign on the environment in history. I would also say that when we think about who was supporting us and who was opposed to us, first of all, we had more than two times as many business 
and business organizations supporting us. But when you look at who the businesses were, it's really amazing. The, the businesses that supported Yes on 23, Tesoro, Valero, Oxy, Coke, Marathon. The big businesses that were no on 23, Google, Nike, Gap, Levi's, PG&E, Cisco, HP, Sempra, eBay, Warner Brothers, Virgin. That's a really different group of people. And in addition, when you see who gave money, I don't want to call these people out because you know, a lot of them are private people and there's no reason. But if you look at the IQs of the people, not including myself, and I'm a low double digit IQ, but the IQs of the other people who gave money, it's extraordinary. It really is. I, I give you my word that you sit there and you kind of go, wow, I feel better about this because some of the smartest people I've ever heard of, let alone known, are no on 23 in a very substantial way. So let's talk for a second about uh, the result, because the result here was a coalition. And that is really, from the beginning, our strategy was we have the right message. We are correct. We will never be ashamed to go anywhere. We will never be ashamed to talk to anyone. We will never be shy away from getting on the podium with TJ Rogers to talk about what we're doing. And that means we have to have people from the groups who you traditionally think will not support clean energy. So that means explicitly Republicans. And it meant from the beginning, I mean, we had basically three significant Republicans. George Shultz, of course, who has, you know, he's 90 years old. He has done, an, he's done three or four cabinet positions going back to the Nixon administration. The weekend that I went to a multicultural event to raise money in Oakland with a sort of Jamaican band, he was at the Reagan weekend at the Bohemian Club. So that's my idea of a coalition. It really is, is that we, we have to have both those things. We also, Governor Schwarzenegger was very important in terms of talking to corporate interests in California. And Meg Whitman, believe it or not, it made a difference that she came out against 23. And let me give you an example of why this mattered in California, but more than that, why it will matter in the rest of the country. I have a roommate who's one, an old roommate, who's one of my very good friends, who's extremely environmentally conscious. He's a business person. He went to business school with me. He is, you know, a very successful guy who's made a ton of money and lives in LA. I talked to him at the beginning of this campaign and asked him to help, help us. He is a lifelong Republican son of a Navy pilot in World War II, who is a very patriotic American, very conservative. And he basically said, Tom, thank you for doing this. Here's some people you can call, you know, I'll see you in a few months. Basically, get out. You know, I can't do this. I'd like to do it, maybe, but I'm not gonna help you. After Meg Whitman came out against 23, I called him back and I said, I know you've got problems with the people that you live with who are your peers, the other senior Republican conservative business people in California, but you've now got the governor, George Shultz, and the Republican candidate for governor coming out against 23. You know this is your issue. Your father didn't shy away from his issue. You can't not be against 23 for me. And he completely changed. And that is a coalition. To get a coalition, you need visible leaders so that you can go to the people who are part of their constituency and make your pitch and not be thrown out of the room without a hearing. And that's, it was really important for us that we have people in the different areas, not just, I mean, ethnicities, also in terms, but definitely a bipartisan group. Let me say this, we also have been able to make the, this is something where I do not believe that this will happen as a logical, thoughtful, intellectual exercise in, in the American polity. I don't believe that for a second. You know, we are up against, in my opinion, as much inertia as opponents. If it's really just a question of a big fight with people who have economic interests against us, you know, we're all up for that, that's awesome. You know, we can just get in a big fist fight and we will win that, it, just the way we won Prop 23. That isn't actually gonna be the hard part for us. The hard part for us is that there is an enormous economic institution, the whole energy complex, that makes a ton of money and the thing that's gonna happen tomorrow unless 
there's a big change is exactly what happened today, only a little more so. So when we think about this conversation, salience is really important. People have to understand, oh my gosh, this is totally relevant for me. I am, this is an important thing. This is going to change my vote. This is going to change my life. And until that happens, I do not believe that we will be able to get the kind of, this is not a minor change. Energy runs through every part of our day and every part of our economy. To change this is going to take a massive change of attitude. And it's one of the reasons I felt so strongly that we'd never get a, a major energy bill in 2010 is I can't believe it's going to happen without a huge conversation at the national level. And if you think about the health care bill, if you think about civil rights, if you think about when we've changed massively, there has been a huge conversation with everybody participating, with people airing all their views, with a close examination of what's going on. And I just couldn't believe that, that was, it was going to happen in 2010, particularly in a tough environment economically, without that kind of conversation. And there hasn't been that kind of conversation. So since Prop 23, so when I think about Prop 23, there's a, it's a pretty simple for, story and I've, I've tried to delineate at it. But since 23, I view it as it's kind of more of the same on a national level. You know, the, the news came out, I believe it was yesterday, that 2010 was the hottest year on record. Nine of the 10 hottest years were between 20, 2000 and 2010. The, the, the other 10th was in 1998. At the same time, I, w I did a, a search of the Wall Street Journal stories since uh, the vote on, in November, and probably the most prominent one about uh, clean energy and was George Gilder, California's destructive green jobs lobby, the new energy cap dooms the state to bankruptcy. So if you think that you know, on a national level, somehow Prop 23 has resonated, and that you know, it's a new era, I would suggest to you that that's not true at all. You know, we are definitely in a long conversation in which I believe, the good news is we will inevitably win in my opinion. The question is how soon and what will be the events that will force people to recognize we're right. It's much better if we don't have to wait for terrible events to prove us right. So, I want to talk about what I think we can do, but let me fr explain to you what I think this is about. Because I spent a long time saying to people, how can people be arguing with us about this? This seems like a laydown. You know, what's the controversy? And my partner, who is a, a scientist by training, said to me, Tom, this is a simple conversation. This is the conversation between the people who think in years with the people who think in decades. And so for everybody who thinks a year at a time, it's like, what's the big deal? You know, over the next year, this is not salient to me. And for the people who want to think longer and want to have some, you know, be doing the right thing for more than the next 12 months, it's also a lay down. And that's the conversation we're having. So let's talk a little bit about how we're actually, how this is actually going to play out, in my opinion, and what we can do from an organizational standpoint not to replicate the coalition that we had against 23, but to talk about how we change the conversation, how we shake this up so it isn't just more obfuscation, climate denial, you know, kind of low level of salience for the American people. So my sense on this is very simple. To succeed nationally, we have to succeed in California in proving that this works from a business standpoint. And we're going to be under the microscope. You know, if you read the New York Times today, uh, front page of the business section, left-hand side, about how hard it is to get permitted for some solar stuff in California. We're going to be under the microscope. We're going to be under the microscope both in terms of how it works and how the economy does. So first of all, we've got to be on that really hard. At the same time, we've got to be building our national coalition. But let's talk, so I'm going to take those in order about what I think is going on in California and what's going to be necessary for us to win, and then I'll talk a little bit about how I think we can build a national coalition. I, I think California is fairly straightforward. It's retrofit, 
build the renewables market, create a good climate for clean tech businesses and manufacturers. So those are the three things we need to do. They have different time frames. I actually spoke yesterday to try and talk to the Democratic state senators up in Sacramento talking about what they needed to do. I don't know if I was insightful and I don't know if I changed any minds, but I did go up there and say, you know, this, I'm a business person, we do investments, I've done investments for 30 years. These are the things that investors worry about. The easiest part of this is retrofitting. You know, if you've looked at the numbers, there's three billion square feet of commercial office space, the paybacks are really good, we need to make sure they can be financed, but we can get a huge jump on all this stuff Getting business people to make smart decisions about retrofitting commercial office space, it can save an enormous amount of energy, it looks like about 40% on average. Uh, the payoffs are good, it's a great start, we can do it right now, and in fact, we've been trying to, it's, and it's also great jobs, because the th if you look at California, I'm gonna digress a tiny bit here, the construction industry shed a third of its jobs between 2007 and 2009. We all know why that happened. Those jobs ain't coming back. Not in home building in the state of California in the next few years. Those are also jobs that cannot be outsourced. So from a California standpoint, it's really important that we do this retrofit, partially because it's great from an energy standpoint, partially because it'll make our economy point about creating jobs, creating, you know, lowering our high unemployment rate. So that's one thing that we've got to do. It's got to happen and we're pushing it. The second thing about renewables is something where we've got to be hard-nosed, we've got to be smart, we've got to look at things from a you know, data-driven standpoint, and it's going to happen. You know, that was really about setting up a playing field where it can happen, and a lot of you guys are involved in that and know more about it than I do, so I don't want to stress on that for the moment. What I do want to talk about is setting up an environment where businesses can succeed. Because we, there's a real reason why California can succeed in this, you know, we have most of the venture money, we have a history of innovation, we have, uh, the, we have demands based on AB 32, we have a green consciousness, and we have a pool of entrepreneurs and engineers that can make this happen. So we have huge advantages. We've done it in IT, we've done it in biotech, we've done it in aerospace. California can do this very well. I have very, very little doubt that we will create a lot of businesses in California to address this problem. That's what we're built to do, it's gonna happen. I'm not worried about that. There's a disconnect here, however. The question is, if we create the businesses, where will we create the jobs? Because if there's one thing going on in the, state, in the United States that people don't seem to get, it's that there isn't a California economy, there's not an American economy, we're part of the global economy. And so when people in DC wonder why the breakdown has occurred between growth and job creation, and that's something that people have been debating, you know, why do we have 9.4% growth? When actually we're growing, I mean, unemployment, when the models that they have said we should never have gone over eight and a half and it should be trending down into the eight or high sevens, they're really wondering about this. And it's actually very simple. We're in a global economy. We've created tens of millions of jobs other places. And so when we think about California succeeding, don't forget, the jobs part of this, if we don't have an environment that is conducive to locating things here for the people who are not the entrepreneur, not the design person, not the chief engineer, but the, the people who are doing the actual building of manufacturing stuff, we're not gonna get the kind of job creation that we need. And that's actually gonna be important from a policy standpoint. So I was up there saying, you guys have gotta start thinking about us as part of a global economy and you've got to understand that every business person around the world can do the cost analysis on every line of their income statement by um, you know, area. So it'll be labor, energy, regulation, inputs. And I, and I told him a story, which is, I was in Peru about a, nine months ago visiting a guy who makes tiles and bathroom fixtures. So I was in Lima, I happen to really love Peru, and it's never been an industrial center. Most people don't even think it's part of the industrialized world. I mean, it's not China, it's not uh, Japan, it's not Western Europe. It's a place that people think of as kind of at the end of the earth and not particularly advanced. They happen to be wrong, but I, 
So I was down there visiting a toilet manufacturer, and I asked him about how he, you know, who he sold to and what his costs were. And he brought out a software program that showed his costs, every line of his income statement, against people who produced it in Brazil, people who produced it in the US, people who produced it in Europe, people who produced it in China, and then he showed the shipping costs and the delivery, what it cost to deliver it to every single continent in the world. So you're talking about a toilet manufacturer in Lima. I assure you, every business person in the world can do that. So if we're gonna succeed in California, we have huge advantages, and we need as strategically to make sure that we provide environments where people can operate successfully because the costs here are not out of line for new businesses that are growing. But I was saying to these guys, you know, we have had an almost arrogant attitude about business in the sense that if you are lucky enough to be here, here are the rules and that's the way it goes and that's gotta change if we're really gonna succeed here in terms of creating clean energy jobs and showing the world that this is a huge advantage for the people in terms of jobs and health. So let me talk for one second about the coalition. Believe it or not, um, I'm not that worried about Democrats. I'm a Democrat, I was a delegate to the last two Democratic conventions, so, which is why I could be a co-chair with George Schultz. But I don't believe that the Democrats who I've spoken to for the most part, they're not gonna fight this, they're also not gonna fight for this in a passionate way. That is not what's going on in Washington, D.C. I don't know who there you know, really feels that they're willing to lie down on the tracks for this, but I just haven't seen it. So I don't feel that, the, that our goal has to be Democrats. I think our goal has to be to build the coalition. And there are really four groups that I think if we had them, we'd get the passion. If we had them, we could go anywhere in the United States and make this argument. Number one, of course, is business. We, I don't believe business people are bad. I'm a business person. I believe business people have no interest in going home and telling their kids, you know, today we really screwed up the planet. It was terrific. You guys are screwed for the rest of your lives. They don't want to do that. They want a chance to participate this, in this in a way that can work. And I think that, you know, that is a message that can only be brought by other business people and other people who are trustworthy messengers. Because one of the big things I believe is you've got to have a messenger who can be heard. You know, you really do. It's not just the message, it's who presents it and how they present it in a way that people can accept it. So business is one huge point I think we have to make. The second is Republicans. I have no, I, I don't believe this is gonna happen without Republicans believing they can be part of this coalition. They may not dominate it, but they've got to be part of it, and it's got to be a conversation we, can, we have. We cannot be fighting a united group of Republican legislators and voters. And I believe that's something that should happen, and I actually am going to go back and talk to a really, really conservative research guy in one of the leading think tanks in D.C. who is also an old friend of mine to try and make the case to him. And if anyone was responsible for torpedoing Waxman Markey, it's probably this guy. He was telling me the strategy of how they did it, exactly the, the information they used, exactly how they went after every single senator. And so if anyone was responsible, I actually believe this single individual was, and he's also a close friend of mine, and I wanna go back to him and say, you know, you've gotta change for your own sake. It's, you're embarrassing yourself and you'll be ashamed of yourself. So I think we gotta go Republicans. I mean it. <laughs> One of the things I truly believe we have to do for this to work is I believe we have to approach communities of faith. Because if you want to really hit people where they live to make this salient, we have to be able to sit down with people of faith and explain to them why, if they think about it, this is a truly important part of what they believe. I happen to be pretty religious. I have no qualms about sitting with people and talking about God. And I think unless we do that, unless we can relate to people on that level, we're cutting ourselves off from a lot of the way people really make decisions going forward, and I think a huge potential ally. It's not that, I believe that a lot of different faiths are supportive of us, but I don't believe that it's something that's our leading priority for them, and I don't believe without that it's gonna happen. And lastly, I think we can get a huge amount of support from national security. 
That means people in the military, former military officers, and people who've been responsible for national security. Because that is something where I actually don't believe this is the argument that will sway Americans to make this important. But I believe that if you want to win an argument, you've got to show up with people who give you credibility. And I don't know how many more people have, how many people have more credibility than some general with four stars on his shoulders or somebody who's been planning you know, the most serious military operations or who's flown a bunch of combat miss missions. Those are people who get a ton of respect and I believe there are people who understand what this means to the United States and are going to be willing to step up with us and really care about it. And I think that if we can actually go to those four people, we will always have the people who are traditional allies. We'll always have the environmental groups. We'll always have you know, the people who are the most liberal. In order to win this national argument, we have to be able to reach out to the people who aren't our natural allies and convince them not just that we're right, but that it's really important that they be on our side. Because the salience of this, the fact that people believe this is a huge part of what is going to happen to this country, to themselves and their families, is the way that we're going to win this argument. Ultimately, of course, we have to get to DC. But I've had a completely different attitude about DC than most of the people who are admittedly smarter than me and have more experience. My experience going and reading history of when things happen in DC is after the country decides what it wants. You know, they didn't lead the civil rights movement. The civil rights movement was won long before the Voting Act. That was something where by the time that we got the Voting Act, the fight was over to a very large extent. That's what's gonna happen here. DC is not gonna lead. DC is gonna be the validation of the conversation that goes on across the country and that hopefully we will be pushing and winning on a consistent basis over the next years and hopefully not decades. Thank you very much. Hi, Shannon McElyay. Um, were you aware that Admiral Mabus and also a retired Brigadier General uh, in the Army were, were um, promoting clean technology for the sake of security as well as the um, environment and health and all those? You know, I was, although I've never heard them speak, but during the campaign, we, I did because George used to be the Secretary of State and because he's at Hoover, which has uh, big ties into the national security apparatus, I got a chance to listen to some, some of the senior strategists in the military talking about the importance of clean energy. And I mean, it's incredibly powerful. I, in all seriousness, you wanna salute the whole time. And the, the military, A, uses 2% of our energy in the United States. The, the Defense Department, the, the, the different services use 2% of all the energy in the United States. In addition, I believe, and not everyone would agree with this, but we've been fighting wars to support the, you know, our energy complex now for a really long time. And those are the people who go over there and fight the wars and get shot at and die. So I think they understand the significance. I, I specifically, I believe, Dwight Eisenhower said in like 1954, if we ever import more than 20% of our oil, we're at great risk as a nation. We import, I don't know, 60% right now? So I believe these guys are incredibly powerful allies in discussion. Just, uh, just quickly, what do you think of TJ Rogers' viewpoints on this? And secondly, uh, more seriously, can, can we get to the likes of Senator Luger and some of the more moderate Republicans quickly before the hardness sets in in the Washington debate? I don't, you know, I'm, I, I, A, I fortunately did not hear T.J. Rogers, um, but I will address what he said. And I don't know on D.C. because I, I really do think I'm not, pest, 
optimistic about DC in the short run. I'm just not optimistic. There, it seems, as an outsider, it doesn't seem as if there's the kind of momentum and passion to push the, uh, something this significant over the top. I mean, it just doesn't seem close to me. I, I don't know how the EPA will work out, you, you know, the, the fight on that. And I think there are people who are working on that night and day, and I would defer to them. In terms of the people who are basically climate deniers, you know, it it'd be, actually would be really fun to debate them. I think it would be really interesting. I, the sad part of that is there is no absolute proof in this. But I view this as like the smoking debate. You know, in 1989, I was, uh, you know, out of business school. I'd been investing professionally for 10 years. And the CEOs of all the major tobacco companies stood up in front of Congress together, put their hands on the Bible, raised their right hand, and swore that there was no explicit connection between smoking cigarettes and cancer. And in the same way that they were, you know, they, I'm sure they were sitting to themselves and saying, okay, maybe it's 99.99, but it's not 100. I don't think, you know, what he had to say, part of it I think is, is kind of nutty, which is as to whether the world is getting warmer. Part of it I think is, as an investor, very, very, very foolish, which is let's wait until we have 100% proof. We don't have 100% proof and we don't have the luxury of waiting for 100% proof. I think we have overwhelming evidence, and that's what we're gonna to have to go on, and that's what we're gonna to have to rely on. But in addition, I would say to him, there are a lot of reasons to do this. The reasons not to do it if you're wrong are so overwhelming that I, I just don't think that that is a stance that anyone should take. I really don't. You know, I was, went, went to Yale undergrad, and Yale has 12 residential colleges. One of them is named for the senator from South Carolina who defended slavery most uh, effectively in the 19th century, John C. Calhoun. And people are still trying to change the name of that college every year because they don't want to have somebody who may, took that stand you know, as a representative of the school. And that's really the level that I think we're talking about here. So I think in terms of T.J. Rogers, he can make as many niggling points as he wants to make. But the, fact, the facts are actually overwhelming and the preponderance of the evidence is overwhelming. And I don't think we have the luxury of hoping that he's gonna turn out against all of the odds to be correct. Tom, to your, to your left. Hi. So, um, so uh, uh, to your left, waving. Oh, sorry. Hi. How are you? That's right. Uh, uh, so two quotes to start my question. One is, uh, in the democracy, you get a gov the government that you deserve. And the second, the old Pogo quote, which is, we've met the enemy and he is us. Um, <laughs> I have a bet. I'm going to give you a quote. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, yesterday, we heard John Hoffmeister talk about, uh, talk about uh, increasing supply to drive down price as a way of creating uh, room for clean tech to develop. Uh, and uh, uh, the theme there was that people are unwilling to, uh, he said, or, or there's going to be a crisis. He said there is going to be a crisis. The theme there was that people are unwilling to accept change until there's really immediate pain. And you, you, your construct is one year versus decade, for example. But, but so, with, so at, at the end of the day, what are some practical ideas about getting people to deal with the short-term pain that will come with structural change? Uh, um, and have you had any thought about that? Right? Yeah. Okay. Well, look, look, that's a complicated question, so I'm going to give you a rambling answer, if that's okay. Um, first of all, I want to give you a, th my quote, so I get that out of the way, which I love, which is from Steve Jobs. And they said to Steve Jobs, Steve, how much money do you spend on market research in figuring out your next, uh, you know, your next uh, gadget? And he said, zero. It's not the American consumer's job to know what he wants next. <laughs> and that's what I'd say here. You know what? In DC, people are poll driven. I promise you. It's amazing. I always say, in DC, polls are wisdom. And you're polling people who don't know much, have not researched it, and 
for whom it may not be that they haven't realized whether or not it's important to them. So I would go with Steve Jobs. If you're a policymaker, you don't go to someone who's spending no time on them uh, on the question and ask them what to do, and then that's your answer. You're Steve Jobs. You're supposed to be looking out and making sure that you're doing the things that are right and anticipating what's important. You anticipate what the consumer wants. You don't listen to what they want and give it to them because they don't know. And that's exactly the same case here. This is going to be, and so when you think about it, the great challenge of policymakers and politicians is basically interpreting for Americans, interpreting for constituents what you n believe fervently to be the right thing in a way that they can hear it. That's the actual job, is the communications job of taking what you believe to be right and turning it into something so that when a family sitting around a kitchen table worried about the mortgage, worried about school, worried about health care, it's salient to them. It's something where they can relate to it, it's important to them, and it means something. And the person who, who said that originally was Bill Clinton. He said, it's not enough to have the right policy. If you can't explain it to Americans in a way that it means something to them, it doesn't mean a darn thing, because you can't get it through. So as we look forward, I mean, if you'd said to me at the beginning of this Prop 23 fight, the person who's going to be most credible to Californians is a very nice woman from the American Lung Ex Association named Jane Warner, that she's the person Americans are going to trust with a message about clean air and asthma. I would have said, you know, I doubt it. I, I, I guess it's possible, but I really doubt that. So as we go forward, I think we're going to have to be smart in thinking about how do you make this meaningful for Americans? I mean, I'll give you another example from history. Um, during the run-up to World War II, when Europe was in crisis and all the countries were falling and we wanted to support England, but we couldn't support England because it was extremely unpopular. Because even though we thought it was the right thing, we, we said, you know, it's, no one will, Roosevelt couldn't, had no support. And he came up with the Lend-Lease program. And he explained it to Americans as, if your neighbor's house is on fire, you're not going to refuse him a hose to turn water on his fire. And that was the way that Americans could explain building ships, warships, and sending them to the Brits to defend Atlantic shipping and defend them against the U-boats of the Germans. So when we think about this, I, it's not the Harvard-Yale Debating Society. It's about trying to relate to human beings who have pressing needs of their own and making it salient in a way that they can understand it and, it's, and they care and they come to the right conclusion on their own and not by forcing it down their throat, but by making them part of the conversation. And that's what we're going to try and do. Big thanks to Tom, not just for that great talk, but really for the dedication, commitment on, on behalf of the entire industry. Tom Steyer.